the intention of our uh, call is like hybrid meetings. I got some people remote, some people um, in person. And I drew a picture of what I thought that looked like in your context, but I bet it's a little bit different than this. So you've got my nice little TV up here, and then you yeah. got a conference room or some space with people in person. And yes. then the numbers here might be different, um, possibly, but essentially, like lots of people have found themselves in this context where they're uh, blended and mixed. Yeah. And so let me pause my mouth and just share a little bit uh, of like added detail, depth, or dynamics that you've seen showing up over the last couple of months. And then we're going to focus on uh, what can we do to make those better, as good okay. as possible. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Sounds great. All right. So added context to this. Um, anything uh, here is, does this actually look like your meeting? Yeah. And if you want to give me some actual numbers, we'll write them down um, and we'll speak specifically to your, that context. It depends on day to day or like week to week because a lot of people travel in the team. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it can be pretty equally balanced sometimes. Okay. I would say most of the time, if it's going to lean one way or the other, it's going to be probably towards the conference room, maybe 12, 12 people. I don't know if there's ever been 15 in the room. Okay. We'll sometimes, call 12. Yeah. Sometimes there's so many people around the conference table that the smart camera, you know, we have like smart camera that supposedly moves and, and sees who's talking in the room. But it misses. It misses people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so people. Yeah. And then the other thing that I really don't like about it is that the only way people show up on the screen is if they have their camera on. If they don't have their camera on, then if you're in the room, you don't even know they're there. Interesting. Unless you uh, log because... in, like you can log in like on your own laptop in the conference room and just be non like a non-participant or something that way you can yeah. see that aggravates me a lot one of the other big dynamics of this is that most of the time our team leader is in is um, one of the virtual people so the conference room is in orlando the virtual team people um some of them are like one guy lives in kazakhstan one guy lives in paris some one guy lives in minnesota Several people are in Texas, either Austin or Houston. And so the team leader- Time zone culture mashup. Time zone culture, <laughs> yeah. Time zone. So the guy in Kazakhstan, it's oftentimes like 11 o'clock at night for him when he tunes in, which he does on a, in a very oppressive, impressive, like on a regular basis. But you know, you're getting a sleepy version of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got two young ones. I'm I'm sound asleep by about 8 30 p.m. every night. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, the idea so, of being present at 11 is not possible. What so. is the purpose of the meeting? Obviously, that changes and evolves, but that's a lot of people in a meeting, 24 people. And this yeah. is happening monthly? Weekly. It's our weekly, weekly team meeting. This is a big weekly meeting. Um, so what is the what is the hope? in general, I'm assuming, and some things that like most meetings are about is like, can we get on the same page? Can we get updated about what others are doing so that we're not operating in the dark and stepping on somebody's toes? Can we find out where things are at? So it's like update in, information exchange. Yes. Yes. Uh, usually okay. we usually have, there's sub teams on if within that 24 people, there's sub teams with team leaders. So, you know, the writer team, leader will give an update and the production team leader give an update and Chris, the guy in Kazakhstan will give an update on the things he's working on. And so that is sometimes, you know, whoever's in the room that's leading a team will get called on to give a quick update on, you know, what's going on. And if you have questions or if you need input from other people, but that rarely happens. Um, yeah. And then sometimes there's like, like a presentation on, oh, somebody from finance is coming in and telling us how to get better at clearing our corporate cards so that we don't have the IRS breathing down our backs. Yep. So there would be something like that that would happen that might be a 10-minute presentation or something like that. Okay. One of the one of my qualms with uh, blended meetings is that with remote meetings, you have a very big gift that you don't have in in-person meetings, which is everybody can speak at the same time and everybody can listen at the same time. In a blended meeting, that's true, but not good. Um, and so when everybody is remote, it's an equal playing field. And then if you ask a question in the chat, everybody can respond. If uh, your colleague in Austin asks a question, half the group can respond, but the other half is either feeding through one person typing or not 
getting their voice heard at all, et cetera. Yeah. Or they just assume that their voice doesn't really matter because people that are in person will speak up more quickly. I've, I've noticed that, that the people yeah. who are um, virtual, most of them tend to be pretty passive unless they're called okay. upon. And the people in the room are going to be chattier, but we usually end up muting that mic so it doesn't drive everybody crazy. Handful of things are coming to mind right now. Um, I think what we do is just let this uh, organically unfold where I throw out some things and you have full autonomy as we go here to just like press pause or double click and be like, oh, can you tell me more about that? Or like, okay. yeah, we tried that, but it didn't work or um, whatnot. I'm going to start at the very foundational level, which is when you're talking about uh, participation, or I'm going to use the word contribution in a room full of 24 people. My first question is, is the meeting designed for contribution or for consumption? Are you asking and, me? Or do you um, want us to think about that? I think that's a good question to reflect on because I think there's probably parts of the meeting that are designed for contribution and parts of the meeting that are designed for consumption, right? So finance comes in, they're here to give a 10 minute presentation. That is 23 people listening while one person um, speaks. Not, not a bad format. That just is the format. So when I actually go to design something and uh, if this, I don't, I'm not sure that we'll do anything with this recording, but if we do, when I actually go to design a meeting, uh, workshop, even a keynote with 3000 people, I am getting a blank piece of paper and I'm writing one, two, three, four, five. And I've got five particular ingredients for engagement that I make sure are included in any gathering. The time that we spend on them and the type of thing that we're doing uh, expands or compresses, but those ideas are first an unofficial start. So what's, what's happening in like, if the meeting starts at nine, what happens at 857 um, to spark immediate and purposeful engagement from everyone, all 24 or however many people are there three minutes before um, into the official start. Number two for me is this idea of a context hook, which is um, whoever's leading the meeting, in my humble opinion, they better have a single sentence that is so compelling as to why the group is there and why their contribution and presence and participation is valuable and worth their time. Because if they don't, then the rest of your meeting is actually going to be 24 different meetings because everybody's in a different context. They had a different morning, different day, et cetera. And so that might look like, just for example, and I'll try to give off the cuff examples as we go. So let's rewind. Unofficial start, that might look like um, as people are coming in, hey, today we've got a presentation about uh, finance. And so just as a way to get our brains in this space, can you tell me uh, in the chat one thing that you believe to be true about money in the chat if you're remote? In person, we've got about three minutes until our official start. Can you just popcorn out things that you believe to be true about money? Just a statement, right? So saving money is good. Giving money is good, right? There's like simple statements about things that uh, about money that are, are related to be true. The idea here is simply, uh, and I probably like think a little bit deep, deeper about that prompt, but the idea here is to get our prefrontal cortex in the context of the meeting. That's the idea of the unofficial start for me. And also set the tone for contribution right from the start. Because how long are these meetings? Weekly, an hour? About an hour-ish. I think it's scheduled for an hour and a half, but it rarely goes that long. So an hour, right? Let's do uh, some playful math, is 60 minutes divided by 24-ish uh, people on the call. That means if every person spoke for a minute or two minutes and a little bit, the meeting would be over. And so by nature of a meeting that uh, big, you're not going to be all contribution. There's going to be a good bit of consumption, which means that many times I'm assuming a meeting ends and somebody was in that meeting and they never said a word. Mm -hmm. Hard to feel seen, heard, and valued and understood if you never said a word <laughs> um, I, in that meeting. I'm feeling and so, that. so for me, like that unofficial start doing something like that is essential because at the at the lowest bar of engagement, it like makes sure that a word is present, <laughs> that their word, their idea is present. Now, typically I try to more than just like, hey, submit something in the chat and then I forget about it and we don't acknowledge it. I'll typically take that another step and do something with it. So for example, um, curiosity ping pong is something. If I said, say something that you know to be true about money 
and then uh, look in the chat or hear what somebody else just said. And can you just ask that unmute and ask that person a question rooted in your curiosity based mm -hmm. on that uh, statement or idea? You don't have to have 24 questions go around. You can even have two, three, four questions, but already like there's a conversational format of that that makes it feel more like a conversation than a presentation. I think I want to pause on context hook because right now, especially seeing that you're like established, like this group has been together for a while, right? Um, so all the norms are already established. And this is true probably for most hybrid um, meetings and groups is they have maybe made some efforts to like do things in a good way, but norms just settle as they are. And it, and now it feels like we're kind of cemented into this format. So how are we going to shift or change this? My personal philosophy on trying to shift uh, culture is, uh, you know, I oftentimes work with groups that want to uh, change the world in some way. So there's your world. Yeah. And my thought is, if you want to change the world, um, don't do that. That is way too big of a task to take off. And so uh, the world, I would say, is made up of, or I would say most of our world is shaped in our speaking and our listening. And so it's a series of conversations that amount to some set of cultural behaviors, norms, ways that we talk, uh, things that we believe, et cetera. And so uh, when I break that down further, which is, we, you know, that's a philosophy of its own, that our whole world is creating our speaking and our listening. Um, if you buy into that a little bit, then let's break it down to just one single conversation. A conversation is one person uh, asking or telling something and the other person receiving or not that thing, <laughs> and then uh, sharing it back, this, this reciprocation. And so if you break that down even further, I would say if you uh, forget about changing the world, if you want to uh, change the world, change your questions, because when you change your questions, you change your conversations. When you change your conversations, you start to shift culture at a much bigger level. And then you got a shot at changing the world. So thinking about a team meeting, that is, I'm thinking about that as a conversation and potentially a bunch of spin-off conversations after that, that happened because of that team meeting. So it may be a place to um, start my initial thought. And I am, uh, by the way, I should, I don't know, I should like give a disclaimer. Like, I don't know the context of this team well enough. I can't provide any actual advice, yada, yada. But when, immediately when I hear weekly team me meeting of 24 people, what comes up is Priya Parker, who wrote a book called The Art of Gathering. One of her uh, ideas or memes in the book is this thought of using purpose as your bouncer, meaning use purpose as your bouncer so that people, uh, when they try to get into the meeting, as opposed to just being like, this is a mandatory got to be here uh, meeting, is the purpose clearing, clear and compelling enough that people know whether they need to be in that meeting or not. Because I would say it's possible some people out of 24 don't actually need to be in that meeting. Or if they do, it should be a 20 minute meeting um, instead of an hour uh, long meeting. And, and the, the scope of what's shared and exchanged in that meeting should be, um, or could be tightened a little bit. And sure. so as opposed to like, you know, if I was working really, if I was consulting really deeply um, with y'all, I, I probably would not start in the place of let's design the meeting for 24 people. I would say, let's reevaluate, like, what is the meeting um, intended to accomplish? Can you do things outside of um, that time? For me, meetings are for conversation and uh, asynchronous Slack, email, whatever else are for information. And so if it's like, if it's mostly informational, um, giving out like, it's hard for me to advocate for synchronous time because you could record a message and send it to somebody and they could watch it on two times speed and they would have got it right <laughs> in half the time. One of the other elements that happens every week is um, a short devotional by somebody in the team. Mm -hmm. We also did a thing where people were sharing their five H's. So, you know, just in an attempt to kind of get to know you. So it was like your hot, your hobbies, your heritage, I can't remember where they were. Um, and you could take 15 minutes or so. And people usually created a, a slideshow pictures and stuff sharing about their, themselves. And I think everybody really enjoyed those things. And then we could ask questions and it just kind of gave you insight into that, what made that person tick. So those are some of the things that have happened, that do happen. Let me ask a couple um, questions. How often are you in the format of like all 24 together, whole time? Yeah, we don't break off into small groups. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's super interesting and relevant to me. So my uh, 
wife Kate is a nurse. And so I was, I drew this one time, a little <laughs> heart heartbeat. I drew this for a group of nurses and they were like, oh God, you're an AFib. Uh, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, I need to learn that. The idea though is AFib, VFib, I'm, I would rather have that than this. Right. <laughs> right. So the reason I'm uh, sharing this is when I think of, when I go to take a pulse on a meeting. So if I just jumped into your meeting and I was just observing, one of the things I would do is just take notes and Sharpie on my hand about how many times the format switched from oh. one person talking and 23 people listening. And it sounds like nearly never right. um, yeah, does that format really switch. Good. And so you, this, the meeting is actually in this pattern right now. So, right. Yeah. This is, and so the reason like might not be people in addition, not just you, but people might not be psyched about these meetings is whew, you know exactly what to expect. Brains love novelty, um, right? We get addicted. People, the reason people get addicted to gambling and pulling a slot machine is the, the idea that like the next pull could be the winner. Whereas in this meeting, it's just like the next person to talk is going to talk and all 23 of us are going to listen. It might be relevant for half of us, quarter of us, two of us, maybe sometimes right. all of us. So the reason I'm drawing this is for me, it's helpful to just actually draw out what are the other possible formats that you could be in, in hybrid. So one of them, uh oh, my pencil's got 5% battery. We'll see. That'll be the end of our meeting with our, my pencil. We've innovated ourselves to the point where pencils run out of battery, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, so you're already in uh, this meeting where you've got some people or this format rather, and this is what you're in the whole time. So this is uh, one possible format is that you do breakouts, divide this group in by four and divide this group by four in person. And you have roughly three person little breakout conversations. I would only recommend doing connection before content, which is yeah, going up to here. Number uh, three. Ingredient number three, I would only recommend doing connection before content typically in small groups. Okay. I was Otherwise gonna... it's okay. not, re... it doesn't quite fit the criteria. And so it's lovely to hear a presentation about who somebody is and it does allow 23 people to connect with that person, but they don't necessarily get to reciprocate that connection. So it's, it's a one way connection. It's not bad. It just isn't by my definition connection before content. Okay. And so I would, it, just at the very least, if one thing came out of this meeting, I would remember these green lines and invite the facilitator to like choose. And the simplest format of doing this is choose a question that relates to the purpose of why you're actually meeting, but also invites people's personal story and thoughts and opinion and values into the conversation. Break people up into groups of three for five to 10 minutes and so then come back. Yeah, oh. you said, sorry, real quick. The question relates to the purpose of the meeting and what? Because I think that's purpose. the secret sauce. When I think about connection, I love all your examples, but then I have trouble, like my brain goes, wait, <laughs> I don't know how to make one up my own. Okay, let's make one up right now together. Um, it, let me write out the criteria first. So one, connection before content, um, got to have three criteria. It has to connect to the purpose of why you're actually there. It has to allow people to connect to each other, which seems obvious, but is not. Most meetings don't actually allow people to connect with each other um, because they are one person talking, everybody else listen, listening. And then ingredient number three is it actually, it has to create the option or choice for authenticity or vulnerability, which really in less big language is just, it gives people the option to tell the truth. One of the template questions that, usually meets that criteria is what is one of your favorite stories about blank? So if you've got a finance presentation, you're going to come over here and fill that question in with what is one of your favorite stories about money? Well, and as I'm framing question. this, yeah. It's a great question. I know. <laughs> I've, I've, asked that, I've asked money questions before about people. It's super insightful. Yeah. So that one's easy. Like, you know, a group's going to get bored of that on a weekly meeting. So you're going to want to uh, mix that up. One thing that would be helpful as you're coming up with these is the We Connect cards mm -hmm. um, are, were written in a way. This is kind of an accidental discovery, but the questions were written in a way that you can add context to the end of nearly every question. 
and it personalizes the question to that context. So uh, what is something you would like to do more of with money? Mm -hmm. How did you learn your most important lesson in life related to money? So that one deck of 60 questions now becomes like thousands and thousands and thousands of different questions, as long as you just add your personalized context to it. So I told you, I was going to show you the um, digital form of the deck. Let's see if I can pull that up quick. Um, so there's digital form. So for hybrid, I would just send people to weconnectcards.com and no email sign up, anything like that. And they can click through the questions. And so no dig on the heritage presentations at all. Cause I think that's actually, uh, could be a really cool thing. And if I were to do connection before content and you were to invite me in next Monday to lead this, I would, um, send the remote group, this link, and, um, I would spread out the in-person cards on the table and I would give the directions to choose a card, choose a question that you would like to answer to the group. Okay. So I'd have them choose that card first. So I'm going to go through and say, Ooh, how would you like to be remembered? Okay. This is, the, this is my question. So all 24 people have chosen a question. Now what I'm going to do is uh, say, uh, maybe as our context hook, Hey, there's a lot of us on this uh, call, meaning one hour together is actually 24 hours of human attention. So we better use it really well. Today, we've got so-and-so coming in to uh, give us a quick uh, update on finance or to give us a quick update on where this project is. Let's just stick with finance for now. Give us a quick finance uh, presentation. And so to connect with each other um, across team and cross time zone and boundaries, and also to warm up our brains around money, take the question you just picked and add related to money at the end of that question. And we're gonna break out into small groups of three and just have a conversation answering uh, those questions in groups of three. So how would you like to be remembered related to money? So you've have having them uh, chosen a question, they've opted into the question, you change it a little bit, make it context specific, uh, but at six, and then I would split people out five to 10 minutes in those conversations. And then when they come back from that, so you got, there's a question, groups of three, five to 10 minutes. When they come back from that, now I want to uh, have people popcorn out responses to what they notice or what struck them about those conversations. Do you take another five minutes for that? Maybe, but possibly not even actually. The reason that I uh, like this, what struck you, would you notice is it implicitly invites the group to talk about culture and norms and the communication, not the content. So when you, when people answer this question, what'd you notice about those conversations? Uh, many people, most people will not say things related to money or related to the stories that people told. They'll say, uh, we all had really similar answers or perspectives, or we were all in one place, but we were striving towards something else. And that's uh -huh. something I noticed, right? So now as a group leader, I can reflect back of like, cool, we just had conversations about striving for and aspiration and all the stuff, uh, unrelated to that. And so it's just reflecting that back and popcorning that out, um, implicitly going back to this starts to change the conversation that you're having. So you can move your way around this little wheel here, right? One question shifts that conversation. You reflect that back. Now it's a series of 12 mm -hmm. conversations that you've created in a span of 10 minutes that starts to change a team overall, right? Yeah. Because it was a shared it was a shared conversation, even though in a micro format. So it was almost like all 24 people were having that conversation Yep. At, simultaneously. Yes. Yeah. yeah they're, they're having um, similar conversations, but for me, it's a way of folding time of mm -hmm. saying uh, feeding two birds with one worm is like when only one person's talking, everybody's listening, you're only having one meeting. Yeah. This is why I advocate that connection before content actually saves people time if it's done well, rather than takes time because you can have uh, 15, or in this case, what 24 divided by three is eight. You can have eight conversations in this time that you would otherwise just have one. And so if your question, if your prompt is good enough, then uh, what the output that comes out of that um, will be much more valuable than just have it. You'll get seven times more uh, the mm -hmm. amount of stuff coming out. Have you played with chat GPT at all? Or heard of it? My boys have, my kids have. <laughs> You're like, ah. <laughs> so uh, with these uh, tools, right? If you, um, so before we jumped on, I typed in 
give me a ton of concrete and creative best practices for this hybrid meeting scenario. Mm. And then I copy and pasted this from your email. Oh. All right. So I said, here are several ideas. Rotate facilitators, use icebreakers, use mm. a sign. I actually haven't really looked at them, so I don't know. whether A lot of them are probably your ideas that chat GPT grabbed from the <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, give me more suggestions. Here we go. From the perspective of Chad Littlefield, <laughs> the author. All right, let's see what comes out. <laughs> Why did I bring this up? Point being, my input greatly changes and edits my output. So if I said, give me some ideas to make hybrid meetings better, I'm going to get one set of responses. If I said, give me a ton of concrete, creative best practices for this specific hybrid meeting scenario, prompting artificial intelligence like that, very similar to prompting human intelligence. If you give a prompt to a group and it is like a meh kind of prompt, then you get meh kind of conversations. And so as a facilitator, like I really care about what that initial prompt is and it's worth spending two minutes thinking about um, before the meeting. We got to just check back in and see how it did. Chad Littlefield is the co-founder of We and Me, expert in creating connections, fostering positive team dynamics, drawing from his perspectives. Here are some more suggestions to enhance your hybrid meetings. Focus on the purpose, mm -hmm. intentional questions, mm -hmm. practice empathy and active listening. <laughs> these aren't terrible. Encourage storytelling. Did I, have I not done these things already? You yeah, could have yeah. saved a lot of time, Julie. Of you should have just yeah. asked. <laughs> <laughs> this is cheaper. <laughs> Look at this host connection labs. <laughs> Appreciate your inquiry, check-ins, corporate team activities. Yeah. Not bad. Not terrible. Now give me 10 fun, not cheesy activity suggestions that take less than 10 minutes. Am I slowly converting you from this is a dumb thing your sons play with to like maybe this is actually kind of cool? <laughs> You know, they were so excited when I guess it was for Thanksgiving when my son was in Atlanta. I was down and uh, he was like so excited to show us. And I, I was like, okay, this is like eerie. Like, I don't, mm. it makes me pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, um, it is. It, it is uncomfortable, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, well, I'll, I'll, yeah. I will turn it off then. We can stick our head back in the sand and pretend I mean, it's not this happening. Setting, it's kind of funny. It's like, how is it different than just typing in Google? I guess you're, it's, it's not uh, all the ads and all the other stuff that is trying to redirect you. So the chat. Yeah. I mean, 95% yeah, less ads. And even when you get past the ads, the first like four pages of people there have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to be there. Right. And so it's like, yeah, this doesn't kidding. feel unbiased. <laughs> right. Anyhow, I think for the sake of time and uh, well, actually let me first pause. My brain is shifting to like, uh, and I don't know if this is too surface level because what you've described are like, these are some like deep team dynamic stuff that like needs some really focused uh, effort on. So my, I guess my question is in the um, time that we have left, is there anything that you want to double click on or um, ask a little bit more about knowing that my, the place I was about to take us is just a few like facilitation technique kind of things or ideas that might be related, that might be helpful for the person leading the meeting, which yeah. may or may not be. It's, well, I get to lead it tomorrow because uh, okay. all the leaders are in a retreat this week. So ah. <laughs> I, I, I was the one who asked on Slack, hey, are we still having a team meeting if all the people who normally lead it are off site on a retreat? And so guess what? My boss texted me last night and said, hey, would you be interested in leading the meeting? <laughs> but it's just like, just for, for connection and yeah. like, and time to pray together. And I, hopefully people who are virtual will also come. I think they probably will some. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of excited to try some of these things even then. I mean, I wanted you to finish your list. You gave me one, two, three, four, five, and I've only got one through three. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I do want to double, I, although I, this is feeling familiar, I think maybe you've covered this in a video, um, but it's still good to hear it again. And the unofficial start versus connection before content. Mm. Um, I probably have some questions there, but let's, I'm, I'm, anything you want to throw at me, Chad, would be yeah. great. And, All right. <laughs> um, and I'll probably spend a lot of time to, this afternoon going through your YouTube channel again. All right. Real quick, distinguishing unofficial start connection before content. Um, 
for me, there is absolutely overlap. The unofficial start is quicker and lighter, in my opinion. Okay. Um, it's it's quicker and lighter, and I, I skew it more toward fun rather than conversations that matter. Fun and like, and that my goal there is contribution. It would be lovely if a couple people made connections of like, oh, I didn't know that about this person. But like, we're not, I'm not doing breakouts in an unofficial start. The other thing is the unofficial start is like rolling. So it's something that can happen while people are coming in. So when attendee number one pops into the Zoom room, I'm like, hey, how's it going for an unofficial start? Um, can you just drop your answer to this question in the chat? What is something you'd like to do more of? And as people walk into the room, hey, before you sit down, can you just toss your answer to this in the chat and sign it with your name um, to this question, right? So that everybody remotely can get everybody's answer and response who's in the room. So we'd need, yeah. Also quick. We could do it on a whiteboard probably. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You could do it on a whiteboard. Um, you can unmute and echo some of those things back there, That some of the things that are on the uh, whiteboard here. And then before I jump up to four and five, mentor mind always reminds me that uh, specificity is the soul of narrative. So mm -hmm. um, I think a good facilitator is a very specific and precise in how they're directing a group's uh, exercise intention, stating their intention, et cetera. But with hybrid, it's especially relevant to be clear about the directions and what you're asking of people who are in person and people who are not in person. I let go of feeling like I have to include everyone all the time. Yeah. And sometimes I just say, you know what, for this prompt or this exercise, I only want to hear from people that are remote. And uh, our job in Orlando is just to like really listen and hear what you have to say and hear about your contributions. And after you're done sharing, we'll unmute and let one person ask a question based on what they heard you say. Some, something along those lines, right? But do you see how that's just an example of like the mechanics of facilitation? I'm saying you speak, we listen, then one person asks a question. So I've just given three clear roles. Everybody knows what they're doing. There's no question of, about that. There's no like, in other words, I'm not making it easy for the loudest people in the room to speak or the in-person group to be favored or the virtual folks to be favored. I'm trying to equal the playing ground by uh, being clear about roles. And then I'm going to flip those. Later on, I'm going to say, remote folks, your job is to, um, I'm going to ask Orlando a question. And they're just going to, as quickly as possible, chat about it. And I would love for you all to take live notes of what you hear them saying as we go. So that after they're done, Orlando can read through the chat and see if what they were saying really got across, for mm. example. I'm okay. kind of just make it's easier when there's like a specific <laughs> agenda or purpose. I'm kind of giving general mm -hmm. examples. Mm -hmm. One other quick technique thing, uh, silence is super useful in in-person meetings. It's even more useful in virtual meetings, but in my opinion, it is required in hybrid meetings. So if as a part of your hour, um, like if you're going to at any point in time, if you're going to ask the group for contribution, meaning in this case to use their larynx, if you're going to ask something of people, whether to break out in small groups and talk or to speak in front of a large group, mandatory five to 10 seconds of silence before the first person responds. And so the way that I facilitate that is literally, I know, crazy. And so the way that I facilitate that is by saying, Actually, this card happens to be sitting on my desk right here. Check that out. Mm -hmm. Silence. Mm -hmm. Look at so that. I'll hold this up. If I'm facilitating, I'll be doing this tomorrow when I lead a workshop. When I'm facilitating, I'll say, I'm going to ask you all a question and I'm going to invite your responses off mute um, in the uh, conversation. Don't worry if you speak over each other. I just want like quick, a bunch of quick popcorn responses out. But when I ask the question, I'm going to hold up this card. And as long as this card's on the screen, nobody speaks. Five seconds just to think of your own response before the loudest, quickest thinker poisons the well for everybody. Um, and now we're like, now we're in their brain, not our own brain. And so my question is, based on the last week of work that you just had, Phil, like, what'd you notice about the last week of our team communication? What'd you notice about the last week of our team communication? Take three more seconds with that. And in three, two, one popcorn out a handful of responses.
that popcorn method is really useful for me because you can get like five to 10 people's voices in two or three minutes. Whereas if you like ask a question and then it's kind of the culture is set to like one person takes two to three minutes, then you have only one person talking, yeah. Yeah. sharing their opinion, and likely they're going to repeat themselves at some point because they don't feel heard. <laughs> and then 20% of your meeting time is spent listening to people repeat themselves. Uh, I'm conscious of time because I have a hard stop in a couple minutes. So let me jump up here and do the too long didn't read version here. Um, number four is content, but specifically content that's designed for contribution, not consumption. So here's an outline, one of my outlines for an engage to educate workshop. Okay. And um, what you see, one, you see the ingredients here. So here's an unofficial start, context hook, connection before content. And this is like, this is a pretty in-depth, like I'm I'm sharing a lot of content. I'm facilitating this entire thing. So there's more notes than you would typically have for like a weekly staff meeting. For the content section, I just have my oh, a little key for myself that if something's highlighted blue, it's something that specifically invites contribution, meaning it's something we're gonna do as a group. And so the check here, going back to our notes, the check for whether your content and your meeting is designed for contribution is just go through the agenda and circle, highlight, star, anything that you're actually asking for people's opinion, voice, or contribution in any way. And if you don't have very many highlights, then you can't be mad that no one engaged yeah. <laughs> in the meeting, right? And then for me, number five, the way that you close, especially a weekly staff meeting, um, is the like aftertaste in somebody's mouth. So uh, I have a couple of friends that really love cigars. They're cigar aficionados. I just can't get around it because I wake up in the morning and I still, my mouth still tastes like a cigar. And so just like, mm, I can't do it. For me, that is the potency of how you close a meeting. It's like leaves a taste in your mouth the next morning. And so with what you're leading tomorrow morning, think about what is the last, so if your meeting is going to end at 9.55, what are you doing from 9.50 to 9.55? Because in my opinion, it should be really, ideally it should be really intentional and concentrated, like something that is different. It's in other words, a format mix up. We go back to this heartbeat. I typically will want my closing to be a different format than what's happened before it for a while. So if we've been like, okay, we split out into these groups and then we had uh, another format where uh, one person was speaking to 23 and then we mixed up the format again and had everybody writing in a chat. My closing, I want to be in a different format. So you might consider actually ending in a breakout. You might actually say as a way of wrapping up our meeting, I'm going to split you up into random breakouts. And can you just can you just share one thing that you're excited to uh, explore or pursue a little further this week? Just to have every single person verbalize like one piece of uh, work that they're going to be doing in the next week, which sounds like a weekly staff meeting isn't ever happening. And so it's just another opportunity for someone to be seen, heard, understood, really good for accountability because... There's a bunch of research that when you actually speak a goal or a task into existence, it's more likely to happen um, yeah. if you make that kind of public declaration. Mm -hmm. So for you tomorrow, if the aim is kind of uh, to be in reflection and prayer and connection with yeah, each other, just, yeah, There's not ending a in a breakout sounds great. Yeah. 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 So you feel like in order for it to be a meaningful connection, it really needs to be about three, three to four people or three-ish? Um, I typically am going with truples. Uh, cause I, I don't want to pair and I, you, I use this language with love. I don't want to have two duds pair up with each other, meaning yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. want to pair up two people who have a bad day or two people who just don't want to talk. And then three people, there's enough diversity of thought and ideas to uh, play off of. But yeah, three, three to five is typically, um, what I am going for. All right. Wow. Can I throw out one more off the wall idea that I had before our conversation? Yes. <laughs> at the risk of overwhelming you with all this stuff? No, I mean, I've got um, two pages of notes, but. So one of the ideas that I had, not knowing the like exact context or breakdown of your uh, team was if you've got this like Orlando versus uh, Austin, Kazakhstan and everywhere, Minnesota and everywhere else, I wonder about creating a list of all the people on the team and uh, giving people buddies that are, perhaps random or perhaps strategic and having this be a list. Like if you remember, you remember phone trees, 
Mm -hmm. you know, like your job was to call these three people. Um, so have a buddy list with the name of the person and their phone number right underneath it. So at any point in time, if you want to take a minute to process something or have smaller discussions about it, you can just say, pull up your buddy list or call your buddy and debrief that finance presentation. It's an awesome way to break up the format, mix things up, have a connection. You can have, um, you can randomize that list. You can change it every week, once a quarter, whatever else. If someone's absent, which it sounds like almost always somebody is, um, not a big deal. Just tell them to stay on Zoom and pair up with somebody else who's also still on Zoom. But inviting in, in that, I would actually invite people to turn off their camera, hmm. mute their microphone, and go on a five-minute walk in one direction, calling and talking to their person. And after five minutes, and the timer's going right on their phone, so they just look down, they see they've been talking for five minutes, turn around and walk back to wherever they are. Obviously, that's weather So they and stay in the meeting. They stay in the meeting, but they abandon their computers. And so even if it's cold in Minnesota, they just pace back and forth in their hallway or they run circles in their office to avoid their children. You let them choose. Point is, get away from your screen. And it doesn't have to be 10 minutes. It could be four. Move around for two minutes, walk for two minutes. Just get away from your screen, have a little debrief chat with your person, and then come back and perhaps popcorn out uh, what, what struck you or what you really noticed from that conversation. Interesting. That's one example. So if they're in-person people, you would just pair off and go on a walk? Pair off and go on a walk. Yep. And I'll have, uh, there's an exercise that I just recently wrote a description for that I call me to we with we connect cards where I just invite people to each grab a question, um, walk alone for two minutes. So one minute, one direction and one minute back. Um, and their assignment is to just ponder and reflect on their own response to that question. They're not with a buddy. They're just walking with themselves come back and then split people out into small groups and have them share what came up or uh, their response to that question. Very introvert friendly. You're not putting people on the spot. You're giving people solid two to three minutes to reflect on their own answer. Then you're pairing up in uh, small groups. So that would be another just totally separate uh, connection before content example. And you could do that with a virtual version of WeConnect cards too. choose a question that you'd like to reflect on, go on a walk for two minutes, come yeah. back. Wow.